Hello GCSE students, this is English language, paper two. Uh, this time it's question four. Let's take a look. I'll share the screen and bring up the right question. There it is. For this question, you need to refer to the whole of source A together with the whole of source B. Compare how the writers convey their different perspectives on surfing. In your answer, you could compare their different perspectives. You could compare the methods the writers use. You could support your response with references, references, quotations uh, to the text. The word could means should. In your answer, you should compare their perspectives. How do we know this? Because the question asks you to <laughs> compare how the writers convey their different perspectives. You've got to do it. The next thing, you've got to compare the methods and you've got to use quotations because you always have to use quotations. If we look at what has been written down, the notes I've made to myself thus far, whole of source A, whole of source B, just to remind myself, I've got to use the whole text. Then compare how they convey their different perspectives. What does perspectives mean? And I'm kind of skipping over this bit. It's already prepared because I've said it in a few of the other videos. Perspectives means viewpoint, their point of view. A nice way to think of it is what do each of the writers think about surfing? What do each of the writers feel about surfing? And then you write about it. So we, we need to consider what they think and what they feel. One, we need to consider the methods that each writer uses. Number two, uh, we need to make reference to the text. That's number three. So let's have a read. We must not forget to read that box once more, this box at the top here, because it provides some context which is helpful. And I've underlined the key word already because source A is taken from Morning Glass, the autobiography of a professional surfer, Mike Doyle. And because he's a professional surfer, uh, his perspective, what he thinks and what he feels about surfing is driven, motivated by his expertise. Uh, one presumably doesn't become a professional at anything unless you like doing it. So all of those contextual things that one can infer we can do that as we read it. We're doing it already before. And we can do it before as well, of course, because we've done question one, we've done question two, we've done question three. Um, we're not coming to this new, are we? In this extract, he describes his introduction to the world of surfing at the beach near his home in California in the 1950s. And I'm not going to read um, the whole of the extract because I'm only modelling. I might just read the first couple of paragraphs, what you can see on the screen. The first time I ever saw somebody riding a surfboard was at the Manhattan Pier in 1953. As much time as I'd spent at the beach, you'd think I would have at least seen one surfer before then, but there were only a few dozen surfers in all of California at that time. And like surfers today, they were out at dawn surfing the morning glass. By the time the crowds arrived, they were gone. Now, if my job is to track what Mike Doyle thinks and feels about surfing, well then the first paragraph demonstrates that he is surprised really. Um, he articulates that he was at the beach a lot but it was not until 1953 that he saw somebody at the beach. And because my job is to compare their perspectives and to track what they think and track what they feel, I'm going to write that down. In Source A, Doyle initially expresses some surprise that it wasn't until 1953 that he saw a surfer despite being at the beach so often. Now, there are some nice little touches here, I think, um, that I think that would be rewarded, really, or, or that would encourage whoever was looking at it to think, oh, OK. This is likely to be promising. The first thing is the word initially, because it means at first. At first, 
he's surprised. So it gives me this I sense I'm going to track what he thinks and track what he feels down the piece of writing throughout the extract. Um, here, over here, uh, this is a reference to the text. It's not a direct quotation, but it doesn't have to be because uh, it says references to the text. So now I can begin to do some comparison. And a straightforward thing to do is to compare the, the sort of first impressions from each piece of writing. So let's have a quick look at source B. And again, we're going to pay attention to the box at the top, reminding ourselves of things. Isabella Bird is a British explorer. This is from a letter back to her sister in England, describing a visit to the Hawaiian town of Hilo. In Britain, surfing or surf bathing was completely unknown. So their perspectives are obviously going to be informed by their contexts. In source A, he's a professional surfer, so he's likely to bring some expertise. So I've already said that. By contrast, Isabella Bird knows diddly squat, rather than informal way of saying she knows nothing at all about surfing. Um, and so let's read it. Our host came in to say that a grand display of the national sport of surf bathing was going on, and the large party of us went down to the beach for two hours to enjoy it. It is really a most exciting pastime, and in a rough sea requires immense nerve. The surfboard is a tough plank of wood shaped like a coffin lid, about two feet broad, and from six to nine feet long, well oiled and cared for. They are usually made of wood from the native breadfruit tree, and then blessed in a simple ritual. In source A, Doyle initially expresses some surprise that it wasn't until 1953 that he saw a surfer, despite being at the beach so often, while while in source B, Bird While in source B, Bird reveals she was invited to watch the national sport of surf bathing, an activity, an activity, excuse me, she describes as exciting. So, so I'm just using the text there to demonstrate her first feelings. Um, I haven't made reference to their context because one sees students make reference to context at the beginning of a piece of writing and it just goes on too long. Um, it, it takes too much time. Um, and so it's something to have in the back of your mind that you can insert into the piece of writing as and when you need to, but not necessarily the thing to begin with. So I think the easiest way to begin is use that first paragraph to sort of structure your, your work. What's the first thing that they think What's the first thing that they feel? Doyle is surprised that he'd never seen surfing before. Bird is excited. Now here on, one is just trying to track what they think, track what they feel, uh, and at this time, as we're reading, try and identify the methods as well. So if we go back to source A, Doyle. But this one morning I took the first bus to the beach, walked out onto the Manhattan Pier, looked down and saw these bronzed gods, I think I might use this, all in incredibly good shape, happier and healthier than anybody I'd ever seen. They sat astride their boards, 
laughing with each other. <laughs> At the first swirl, they swung their long boards around, dropped to their stomachs and began paddling towards shore. From my viewpoint, from my point of view, it was almost as if I were on the board myself, paddling for the swirl, sliding into the wave, coming to my feet and angling the board down that long wall of green water. It was as almost as if I already knew that feeling in my bones. From that day on, I knew that surfing was for me. Right, I'm putting on a stupid voice. And I'm doing it to just highlight that this is kind of punch you in the face. Punch you in the face, obvious at times. Uh, and there are, again, no tricks. He's even telling us exactly what he thinks and feels. Uh, so we just have to write it. We just have to write it. In source A. Doyle views the He views the surfers as bronzed gods. And just like with question three that you will have looked at in a previous lesson, the previous lesson, one hopes, you say, what does this word usually mean? How does it apply to this particular question? So in this instance, what does it reveal about Doyle's viewpoint? What does he think? What does he feel? So if he views them as bronzed gods, um, he views them as, well, what's a god? It's the same thing uh, as yesterday, majestically. He views them as gods. What's a god? It's an otherworldly being. Um, it's something some people believe to be supernatural. Um, but it, it's, it's heavenly. And these men are sort of Adonises. They are perfect beings on their surfboards. They are bronzed as if they are sort of mythical figures. So I just need to write that. I really do. Keep it reasonably simple. He views the surface as bronzed gods. Now, it's at this stage that I probably need to include some sort of method. Um, so let's put it this way. Are the surfers gods? No, they're men on bits of wood, literally. They're men on bits of wood. Uh, and the bits of wood are on the sea. So therefore it's figurative, it's metaphorical. Um, and if we're not sure whether it's a metaphor or whether it's a symbol or whether it's um, any other type of, sort of figurative language, we just call it figurative language or metaphorical language. So I'm gonna do that. In source A, Doyle views the surface as bronzed gods. Metaphorical language that reveals he thinks, I'm deliberately including the word thinks, what he thinks, what he feels, he thinks these men to be otherworldly, almost heaven sent creatures. Now what I wanna try and do is just develop this particular quotation a little bit further. The bronze colour of their skin depicts them as mythical figures.
of, you know, he, he thinks they're handsome. He thinks they're pretty sort of hot stuff. I think he actually says they're hot. Um, and he admires them. Now I could pause there and just put a full stop. But I want to reinforce what he thinks and what he feels about these people. Scroll down. The bronze color of their skin depicts them as mythical figures of something resembling unreal beauty. Therefore, Doyle appears to feel they are desirable and admirable. As such, he makes the decision he wants to be like them. Now it's here that one sees students often just sort of put a full stop, but to reinforce the point, to demonstrate to the person who's looking at this piece of work that I really understand it, I want to find a quotation which demonstrates that. And I know from my reading of this extract from um, the previous questions, that he, he says, he says it, and I just read it as well, of course. From that day on, I knew that surfing was for me. Do I need to identify the methodology and what it means for this particular quotation? I don't think so. I, I don't really have anything to say about it. Um, I've already said it up here. Now here it is where I have a choice to make. I can either find another quotation in source A and explain it explain what it reveals about what Doyle thinks and what Doyle feels. Or I can look at source B and I pick a quotation from source B and I do exactly the same thing as I just did for source A. I track what Bird thinks and what Bird feels and I find a quotation which reveals some of those feelings and what some of those thoughts. There isn't really a right or a wrong answer. I certainly have a preference, um, but either is fine. Um, the experts at the exam board suggest that there is no preferred method methodology for this. Um, now, my preferred, my preferred way is to go to source B, and it is only to go to source B for one reason, and that's the question. The question asks you to compare up here, to compare how the writers convey their different perspectives. And if I end up writing about source A for too much, then that ability to demonstrate comparison, which really is what distinguishes this question from all the others, begins to be um, overlooked. And we don't want to overlook it, we need to do it. And so therefore, It's here that I begin to do some comparison. Um, here, I want to revert to the Janus face sentence. I need to look back at what has just been said uh, and use it as a launch pad, a springboard, a little trampoline type thing into my next paragraph. So I've just said here that Doyle appears to feel that these people on the surfboards and surfers, they are desirable and admirable. And I know already that Bird thinks much the same thing. So 
So a Jana's face sentence, to remind you, a sentence which looks backwards at what's just been said, this section up here, and uses that as a springboard into what comes next. And then I repeat the process. Bird also thinks the surf is admirable. For example, when I look at an example, I, I find, you know, I read the extract. It just appeared from nowhere there. Uh, and I, I find an example of where they are admirable. And that's really it. Pick a quotation, explain what it means. What does the word usually mean? And then what does it reveal in this instance about what the two people think or feel? Um, there's no need for an introduction, no need for a conclusion. It's just a case of focusing relentlessly on this question up here. And I'll finish on that. What does source A think? What does the writer think? What does the writer feel? In source B, what does the writer think? What does the writer feel? Tell me that. Get into the habit of using the words think and feel, if that's helpful in your writing, and then it's unlikely that you can go too far wrong. Uh, the key thing this stage is have a go at it, try your best, use those quotations, make the comparative points uh, and, and give it a whirl. All right, thanks very much. Bye bye.